This video is about serotonin toxicity, which at its extreme end has been referred to as serotonin syndrome. I'll explain why serotonin syndrome is not such a good term later in the video. We're going to talk about the causes, effects, the history and the management of serotonin toxicity. And I'll put all the sources I use to make the video in the description below. So what is the history of serotonin syndrome? Well, it was first described in 1960 by a guy called Oates, who described a patient who was taking tryptophan and a monoamine oxygen oxidase inhibitor and actually taking two different serotonergic agents at once is a really key thing to remember about people that develop se uh, severe serotonin toxicity. Sternbach in 1991 was the guy who became famous by proposing a set of criteria to diagnose serotonin syndrome and he did this by just looking at what features serotonin toxicity commonly presented with. He came up with this set of di diagnostic criteria where basically if you take this list of 10 symptoms and then you had any three of them, then you could be diagnosed with serotonin syndrome. The problem with Sternbach's approach is this. We have 10 different diagnostic criteria and you can have any three of them, but they're all quite common and some of them are a bit vague and you can actually get three of, out of these from multiple different presentations that have nothing to do with serotonin toxicity. So I'll just go through a few possible differentials that you could have and how they could be diagnosed as serotonin syndrome under Sternbach's criteria. We'll start with anticholinergic delirium, which could have a fever, could have mental status changes and could have agitation, frequently does. And if you get those three, then you've got serotonin syndrome. Or you could have neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which might have mental status changes, you might have diaphoresis and you might have a fever as well. And uh, then you could also be diagnosed with serotonin syndrome. And Interestingly, you could just have discontinued your serotonergic medication. So you could have just stopped your antidepressant. That can give a variety of the serotonin syndrome criteria, like mental state changes, agitation, myoclonic jerks, depending on which antidepressant you've stopped, tremor, and even flu-like symptoms and a fever. So it's really easy to get uh, diagnosed with serotonin syndrome based on these criteria, but after you've stopped a serotonin education, which doesn't make that much sense. And it definitely didn't make sense to these guys who firstly pointed out that there were some extra criteria in Sternbach's criteria that say you have to have had a serotonergic agent and you have to have ruled out uh, other causes like infection. But they then went on to develop a set of criteria that was more specific and just as sensitive as the Sternbach criteria. And they said that after you've had an ingestion of a serotonergic agent or an overdose, then if you have spontaneous clonus, you have serotonin toxicity. Or if you don't have spontaneous clonus, but you do have inducible clonus, say at the ankles, then you, if you also have agitation, diaphoresis or hypotonia and pyrexia, then you've got serotonin toxicity. But you could have no clonus if you've got a tremor and hyperreflexia hyper after a serotonergic agent overdose, then you can be diagnosed with serotonin toxicity. And if you don't meet those criteria, then you probably don't have serotonin toxicity. And it's worthwhile noting that the serotonergic agent ingestion is really important. So if you've had a dopamine antagonist or even an antipsychotic like olanzapine, which is a serotonin antagonist, then you're clearly not going to be diagnosed with serotonin syndrome based on these criteria because it doesn't make sense based on the pharmacology. Now, what's the mechanism of serotonin syndrome? There's various ways that you can get serotonin syndrome, but basically all of them result in increased uh, presence of serotonin in the synaptic cleft. So here we've got a diagram that shows the presynaptic neuron at the top, and you can see tryptophan being made into 5-HT, which is serotonin. You can see SSRIs and venlafaxine, which is an SNRI, um, inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin on the left. Then in the middle, you can see MDMA and also other amphetamines, which increase the release of serotonin. And finally, we've got all the different types of monoamine oxidase inhibitors that inhibit the breakdown of serotonin. So those could be the irreversible ones, the reversible ones, both of those are antidepressants, and then just random miscellaneous drugs that happen to have uh, an inhibitory action on monoamine oxidase. So they're things like the antibiotic linezolid, the uh, anticonvulsant lamotrigine, and uh, methylene blue as well. And then we've got lithium, which seems to sensitize people to serotonin and increase the risk of uh, serotonin toxicity. Uh, I haven't put opiates on this picture, but several op opiates, including tramadol and pethidine and tapentadol, all have actions at the serotonin receptor and can predispose you to serotonin toxicity, especially when in combination with other drugs.
And the Hunter Group also described three different severities of serotonin syndrome. You've got mild, moderate, and severe. In mild toxicity, the patient might have some signs or symptoms, but they're really not bothered by them. In moderate toxicity, the a uh, patient is getting symptoms that starts to bother them and they should get some treatment for it, but it's not life-threatening. And then we've got life-threatening toxicity, which is where you start to get the rigidity, hyperpyrexia, multi-organ failure, and is a life-threatening medical emergency. Is this scale that really means that serotonin syndrome is not such a good term because it's really a spectrum that goes from mild to severe. And if you have a binary scale of just either no serotonin syndrome or serotonin syndrome, it does not allow you to make that clinical distinction between the medical emergency of severe serotonin toxicity and the mild to moderate serotonin toxicity that does not warrant such emergent management. And the really important thing to remember about serotonin toxicity is that you very rarely get severe toxicity unless you're on two different serotonergic agents, whether that's an SSRI and a monoamine oxidase inhibitor or an opiate and an MAOI or some other combination. It's almost impossible to get severe toxicity from just one agent alone. And that's been really well demonstrated in the case of SSRI overdoses, where people have taken really big overdoses of an SSRI and still only got mild to moderate toxicity from the serotonin. So what's the treatment for serotonin toxicity? Well, the most important thing to think about is cooling. So the hotter a patient gets, the more likely they are to go into various kinds of organ failure and end up with serious morbidity or mortality. So cooling starts with just a cool ambient temperature and uh, then progresses through the use of cool IV fluids, which are the mainstay of cooling treatment, and then could move on to active cooling like ice packs or uh, even intubation and ventilation to uh, reduce the heat production from muscles. And then finally, you could think about things like ECMO if you're really desperate and you're trying to use a way to use the ambient temperature to cool the patient's blood before returning it to their body. The next thing to think about is sedation. This achieves two things. One is that it manages the agitation and secondly, it also reduces heat production from the movement that someone will do when they're very agitated. And benzodiazepines are the mainstay of treatment for this. So diazepam in generally five to 10 milligram aliquots um, until the patient is lightly sedated. And then there are some specific pharmacological antidotes um, in the form of serotonin antagonists. So you could use suprahiptidine, um, which is a serotonin antagonist that can only be given orally. So it's only really useful in moderate serotonin toxicity. But if someone's got severe serotonin toxicity and they're not responding well to benzodiazepines, you could use IV chlorpromazine, which also has serotonin antagonist uh, features and can be given intravenously.